Good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Sam here, United People's TV. It's the 7th of March. It's Thursday. We've got Everton coming up at the weekend. And let's be honest, the managerial, I call it the, the free-for-all, the merry-go-round. Whatever you want to call it, it's in full swing. How many managers have we been linked with in the last six days? I think we're into double figures. And I'm going to run through this this morning. Uh, I don't know if Manchester United fans have actually learned by now. I mean, if you haven't learned by now, <laughs> then you probably never will. But we're going to speak about it as a community this morning. Good morning to all of you. We're going to speak about that. We're going to speak about... There's more reaction to the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer interview yesterday. I did my full reaction on the channel when I focused on the recruitment side of things. But there are a couple of other talking points that we can speak through. For some reason... I've got to have a little mini conversation with a few of you about Gareth Southgate this morning. Yeah, I know. Gareth Southgate. I know. I know. I know. It won't be a long conversation, trust me. Uh, we're also going to speak about, well, other United news. You can let me know what you think in the comments below. As always, any questions, fire them in. I'll try and answer as many as I can. Let's see who's here from the member gang. Good morning to all of you. I said that four times now. Let me just say good morning as well. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, new channel art was uploaded. Big up to Parry for getting that done. Uh, updated one, and it updated on the TV too, so it should look nice and slick compared to what it was before. Uh, Alex, good morning to you. Mania, Natasha, we've got Carl, uh, T, you're there. Um, Sean, we've got William, Ross, we've got uh, Richard, Nima, uh, Ricky, Matt. I don't know why I shouted Matt. Miss Teacup, good morning to you. Saeed, lots and lots of regular faces. How are you all doing? Who's here on Facebook? Oh, someone's nearly been a member for two years. Miles, good morning to you. Sometimes I see, I think some people get offended, by the way. I said this last time, I said, I'll say it again. Some people get offended when I don't read out the, uh, like, the sort of member messages. I don't always catch them. I apologize for that. Uh, Facebook, we've got Chris Hall, Thomas Hayes, Odame. We've got Mal Dooley, Matt Frost, Mark Fossey, Paul Pritchard, Sean Murphy. Plenty of you tuning in. I think it'll be a would it be a good show today? Well, it would be, it'll be an interesting conversation. I need a haircut so bad. Look at this. What is this? Oh, it's catastrophe of a hair. <laughs> my barnet. <laughs> Horrendous shape. I normally get a haircut every two weeks. But obviously I can't because I'm getting my... F well, I can't walk at this moment in time. But fingers crossed. I know it's interesting. Not hopefully getting a haircut this weekend. Miles and Shax, man. How you doing, both of you? Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for generously gifting five memberships each. I'll do a little 10 membership celebration for both of you. Fergie. I can't believe it. Football. There we go. Fergie's in town. Fergie is in town. For some reason, my sound's not working on my computer, but I, no, I, I can see that you can hear it. So that's all right. <sighs> Let's talk about it, all right? Because it's going to be the talking point. Well, <sighs> we're going to be talking about the managerial position at Manchester United pretty Pretty much every single day in some variety, shape or form between now and, I mean, until we know what's happening, until we have confirmation that either Eric Ten Hag is staying for one more season or that Ineos have decided on going to a different direction. Now, I've spoken about this already quite, a, I'm going to be doing one video at lunchtime today on it. I said to you that I'm not going to be feeding into the the hype of it all. I'm not going to be getting caught up and swept up into um, getting angry at us getting linked to a certain manager or getting happy that we're linked to another manager, right? Um, it's That's still the case. But I feel like because of the platform we've got, right, I, there, there's two, there's... There's a couple of ways that I could approach all these stories around the managers, right? I could completely ignore them, right? Just pretend they don't exist. And largely, I'd do that. I could react to all of them individually. I could do a video on Gareth Southgate. I'd do a video on Roberto De Zerbi. I could do a video on Thomas Frank, on Zinedine Zidane, on Julian Nagelsmann. I could do all of those. And that's just not my style. 
what I want to do at lunchtime today is bring it all together because I think United fans need to... I, I, I don't have the right way to describe it. It's 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 not... a They don't need a reality check. It's not they need to learn a lesson. It's just... You need to just gain awareness of what the press do, of what the press have done and always will do with Manchester United. And this is the perfect example of it. Oh, wow. Man, it is rain memberships. Don't know why I did that. Mate, William, Anthony, Gungshi and Iron Potato, all of you together gifting five memberships, which means let's get the party lights on. I need to check. <laughs> I need more of these. I really need time to create more of these. I want to get like two or three different ones so there's, you don't know which one is going to happen every day. Because right now, I, it, yeah, I want to get some variety in there. But right, this is, this is where the story sort of <sighs> jumped forward from yesterday. All right. Honestly, Mania, I apologize, by the way. I, mi I missed that down there as well. Thank you so much. Let's get the 5-1 on. Wait there, I was going on a little bit of a rant about managers there. I was going on a little bit of a rant. You can let me off. Oh, no. One sec. Please work. Uh-oh. Right. We're back in the room. That means I can't press these buttons anymore. Encoding overloaded. Okay, right. So I apologize. I won't be pressing these buttons anymore. We'll leave them to the side. For some reason, I need to restart. Man, it is becoming taxing. I've, my Mac was always good. But now that I've really, really started to go heavy, heavy on the streaming and all that, you know what I'm like, I've got three, three monitors. I've got this open. I've got 15 tabs over there. This over there, Premiere Pro over, open over here. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think my computer's a bit angry at me. Anyway, let me get into the show here. And this conversation, right? Mark Ogden yesterday. Manchester United are assessing options if Ten Hag X6 in the summer. Deserby and Gareth Southgate. <sighs> Gareth Southgate. Man. Anyway, Gareth Southgate, Thomas Frank. Add into that, you've got Zinedine Zidane. You've got Thomas Tuchel. You've got uh, Ruben Amory. You've got Zinedine Zidane. You've got I mean, every, seemingly every single manager under the sun. Now, I'm going to run through this little, about a minute, oh, you can see a minute 48 video from David Ornstein on Sky Sports News yesterday. He was asked about the Gareth Southgate reports. Just take a listen to what he said overall. I hope, I, I hope I don't get shut down for copyright on this, just like I always say. I'm just sharing news. But this is what David Ornstein said about Gareth Southgate and the overall position. And listen to what he says at the end. Well, people you speak to who know Ineos well um, describe them as being very resilient and thick-skinned. And when they've got a clear idea of what they want, they go and get it and implement it. And yeah, they seem to have a, a good relationship with Gareth Southgate, uh, as does Dan Ashworth, the incoming sporting director. Um, once uh, an agreement can be reached with Newcastle over his gardening leave um, and start date. Uh, and so Southgate, you know, possibly is is one in their thinking. Um, you've seen sort of Graham Potter mentioned for similar reasons. He's uh, well known to Ineos because they spoke to him about the niche job. And then you see names like uh, Deserby and and Frank is a, a new one that Mark Ogden brings to the fore. He's also uh, highly thought of at a number of other clubs. Liverpool have been mentioned in the past too. And, and there'll be more candidates as well if Eric Ten Hag is to uh, move on. Eric Ten Hag will have a say in this as well, whether he wants to continue. He's got a year left on his contract this summer, plus the option to extend further. And I like that idea that Eric Ten Hag will decide who will be in that. <laughs> Just the idea. <laughs> uh, no, you can't go after Southgate, but you can go after De Zerbi. Anyway, back to it. Last, last 40 seconds. Nobody's really considered that, you know, he will be part of this discussion too. And so we don't know anything for sure yet, but yeah, I've seen the same fan sentiment as you and, and that reaction, if they are convinced that they need to make a change and they want to go for somebody like Southgate, which is not a foregone conclusion by any means, he's got the Euros with England. He'll have his own decision to make of whether he carries on with England for another tournament or longer or not. Um, yeah, there may be some some animosity towards it, but if they are absolutely convinced it's right and they fit into their 
their system and there's trust mutually um, and it's going to be a success, then then I reckon they would ride the storm to do what they think is best for this project. But I just don't think we're anywhere near that yet. There are no decisions made uh, as far as I know. We are nowhere near that yet. Now, that might be in a bit of a convoluted way to get to that point, but I want to... I, I, I always listen to what David Ornstein has to say. We are nowhere near that yet. And this is the point that I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna do a lunchtime video on this today. Because I, I, I wanna do it once. You can't ignore the elephant in the room, right? And the elephant in the room is that Eric Ten Hag is not guaranteed to be Manchester United's manager next year. The elephant in the room is that we're eleven points off the top four. Well, we are, are we 11 points off? I think we're 11 points off Villa. So I think that is off top four. So right now, it looks more likely that Eric Ten Hag is not going to be our manager next season. Right now. So that's why in that environment, and this is what I mean about once, once United lose a game, all of these stories about United players being unhappy at Eric Ten Hag's coaching, he's making us run too much. They all come out. As soon as United win a game, they all go away. As soon as United lose a game, they come back out. Now that Eric Ten Hag's position here is under threat, it's just an absolute free-for-all for the newspapers to just go, Zinedine Zidane. Gareth Southgate. Thomas Tuchel. What other managers? <laughs> Put it in the comments here. This will be a fun one. On Monday, I think there will be another at least at least two more managers linked with Man United. I'll probably say three, but I'm going to say at least two. What managers are you guessing that are going to be linked with the United job between now and Monday? Let's predict it. Yeah, Thiago Motta, he's already been linked. Don't worry about that. Fergie, <laughs> he might come out of retirement. <laughs> Ancelotti. <laughs> uh, God, Jurgen Klopp. No. Nah. Um, Alex, you're saying if, if they remove Eric Ten Hag's recruiting power, could he walk? Yeah, absolutely, dude. That, that, that is a genuine possibility. Um, Eric Ten Hag, uh, a big reason he took the job in the first place was because he wanted that power position. He wanted that ability to have recruitment. That's kind of the reason why he didn't want to work with um, Ralph Ragnick. So if he does get that power taken away, he might just say, well, this job isn't for me anymore. That could happen. Um, Lampard, <laughs> Roy Hodgson. <laughs> I'll, so, Solskjaer will get linked with it again. Roy Hodgson, Mark Brian Kidd. Look, truth be told, I have no idea. But this is just another... Gareth Southgate, I mean, wow, wow, we were, wow, wow, we were, it's just, um, I don't understand how at this point, United fans can't see this for what it is, it's just, it's just a little bit frustrating really, it's like the discourse and the narrative is so easily driven among Probably all football fans, but United fans, because I'm I get more visibility on them on what's being said in the discourse. I just find it strange. Now, surely by this stage you would realise that just a lot of this is just hot air, like nothing but hot air. It's like angry pub talk. I don't know. It's odd. It's very strange. But as David Ornstein has reiterated right there, we're nowhere near that decision. We spoke about this yesterday. Whether we think. Ineos have already sort of made their mind up behind the scenes, but um, we don't know about it yet. And we kind of were sitting, I think, roughly. About 60% of you thought, yeah, Ineos have probably made up their own mind. And it will be nothing to do with um, a reaction to a defeat to Liverpool. It won't be because of an individual game. It might be once they reach a certain moment, whether that's out of the FA Cup, whether that's mathematically we can't finish in the top four. Because... Top four seems very unlikely now. That that Fulham game, I was looking at the table earlier. That Fulham game is the brutal one. That Fulham game was the one that really sort of uh, killed it, kind of, because then Villa went 11 points clear. Well, obviously after we lost to City as well. F top five is a possibility. It really is. We If we beat Everton this weekend, and uh, Spurs are playing Villa, depending on what happens there. But hypothetically, if we beat Everton and Spurs lose to Villa, we'd be, I think, five points behind Spurs. They'd have a game in... No, no, we'd be three points behind Spurs. They'd have a game in hand. That's Chelsea away. And they also play Arsenal away. No, Arsenal at home. Well, they play Arsenal City and Liverpool in three consecutive weeks. 
Spurs one's going to be an interesting one. I personally don't think top five even, is even going to happen. But just, I'm surprised that there are more United fans. Or maybe I'm not surprised. But it feels like it. I'm kind of surprised that there are so many United fans who just gobble on those low-hanging fruits and just get angry. So, like, personally angry with all these managers who are linked. You know it's just hot air at this point. And there's going to be more to come. I don't know. Just think, you think you'd learn by now. That's the point. With years of it, so much. And that's what I'd want to do a video on this lunchtime to really point that out. Because I think with the platform we've got, we can take a different direction on all this managerial hot air and noise. And hopefully we can help change how United fans look at this news and, and sort of how they absorb it in, in a positive way. Anyway, that's what I'm going to try and do in my lunchtime video. Let's see how it goes. Now, I want to have a little conversation here about um, Solskjaer's interview yesterday. Interview, podcast, interview on the podcast. On Stick to Football, it was class, man. If you haven't listened to it, I did my reaction yesterday, but my reaction yesterday focused, I wanted to sort of laser in on Solskjaer's comments around the recruitment side of things. I thought that was a really interesting, big old talking point. He spoke about the um, how bloated United's structure was, the power of veto that existed with scouts, with Solskjaer, with the owners, how many doors he had to go through before a decision was made, how... They ignored his advice for Haaland just because the data didn't prove that he was the right signing. Go and have a listen to that, right? If you enjoyed that. Well, you might enjoy it. You might not. If you did, drop a like in the video. But there's one particular comment or point that I want to run through. Again, that I've been looking at the reaction yesterday. Again, I'm very surprised at the reaction to this. Now, let me run through it and explain it, right? I want to run through this comment here from Oregon of Solskjaer on his last game against Watford, right? The halftime against Watford, I knew, that's it. So the team talk at halftime was about whoever wants to play, can play, get your hand up if you don't want to play. Made a few changes, a couple of the lads actually in tears and they had a, they had a go. So, are going to sell shy there explaining that at halftime against Watford, obviously that was his last game, right? We lost that 4-1. Half time against Watford, he sits down. Man United are getting battered. What was it, 2 0? Yeah, it was 2 0 at half time. Who wants to play? Who feels like they can still play? Who doesn't want to play? Put your hands up. And he says right there that a couple of the players were in tears. They, it's not that they didn't want to play, it's that they were upset that Solskjaer was leaving as manager. And then you go and you look at what happened here and you see who was taken off at half time and you can see that McTominay and Rashford were both taken off at half time against Watford and this is the, this is the thing that i find very very strange from so many united fans yesterday right solshire there has clearly said he at half time he went into the dressing room there were some players who were upset. There were some players who weren't up for it. He said, who doesn't want to play? Who can't play? Put your hands up. And McTominay and Rashford went off. Now, right there is, you can interpret that comment from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in two very distinct ways, right? Number one, you can interpret that as, ah, oh, they didn't want to play for it. They didn't want to play for him. Ah, oh, they just wanted to throw him under a bus. Ah, oh, they just put their hands up because they, they they had checked out. Or you can interpret that as they were genuinely upset that Solskjaer was leaving and they didn't feel that they could carry on playing. So many United fans, and this is what I mean about, like, you're a fucking United fan. And if you've got those two options and those two interpretations, you go for the one that says, nah, they just didn't want to play. And it's been all over. It's been all over Twitter yesterday. Maybe I know, maybe I spend too much time on Twitter. It's a bit weird. 
I, I, I just find it, I find it strange that United, that so many United fans would jump to that option. It's, it's a very, very, I hate the word, I think the word toxic environment has been overused when describing United fans. Eh, just, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's related to other fans as well, but for so long, it has felt like a bit of a toxic atmosphere. And that's what, you know, being crap for a long time does. You start getting infights. You start getting arguments. This, um, I don't know. I, I find it a very strange reaction to, to interpret that way as United fans. That's the sort of thing that a fan of another club would do. Not a fan of United. Strange. And you know what that also does as well, by the way? So, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer there explaining, he, he knew that it was over at halftime. He basically told everybody it was over at halftime. And it kind of, you know what it does? It makes this, it gives you, a, it, it allows you to um, look at this kind of through a different lens, I think. To wave to the, the Manchester United fans and it looked as though Fernandez was gesturing towards the players saying this is our responsibility as well as Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Jack you remember that? I remember that at the time. And now, and now that you know that Solskjaer had sort of pulled the players to the side and told them at half-time that this is probably going to be our last game in charge and at the end of the game Bruno Fernandes is doing that. It just got a lot of time for Bruno, man. I've always had a lot of time for Bruno. I think Bruno is a player who I will always... I forgive a lot more for Bruno's mistakes than maybe most do, and that's why I think I defend him so much. Uh, plus the fact that he is easily the best signing we made post-Fergie. Uh, but it's just now that you know that that conversation happened between Solskjaer and the players at halftime, that carries a slightly different meaning. Maybe not a bit different meaning, but the context of it allows you to sort of understand that. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just a bit fucking bored of United fans just trying to chew each other's arms off. It's a bit boring, isn't it? A bit angry. It's like some crappy civil war. It's like an ang... It's like the episode of The Bear where they go around the house for Christmas dinner. It's like one of the most exhausting episodes of TV I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> if you haven't watched The Bear, you know I've mentioned it before. Big up to Steve, by the way, sending me the um, the Chicago sandwich shop tea. That was great. But, yeah, I'm just a bit, I'm tired, Robbie. I'm tired of the sort of, as I said, like, like a United Civil War. It's a bit weird. Um, I'm going to read a couple of your comments out around this. Um, Jibak, you just sent a super chat. Thank you very much, dude. What would you say? He's saying, don't believe these players actively throw the manager under the bus. It's more that when the manager is down and there's a bus coming at him, this lot don't step up, melt away and cower and see him take the fall. Well, whether you want to describe it as, I reckon some players have definitely thrown managers under the bus. And then some managers, some players haven't sort of stepped in the way to stop that bus coming at the manager at 100 miles an hour. So I know what you're trying to mean. I know what you're trying to say there. They don't actively throw them under, but they also don't actively step in the way and try and help. Um, last year, so, so many of these players, they were all on board with Eric Ten Hag. We needed this discipline. We needed uh, this. This is this is exactly what Manchester United have been missing. Whether it was Luke Shaw speaking about it, whether it was Diogo Dalot speaking about it, there were tons of players who spoke about it. Oh, this is what this club has needed for so long. Here we go, and we all got on board the hype train. And when it worked in February, like take me back to post World Cup United, leading up to winning the League Cup against Newcastle, that like six seven week period. It just felt like we. Uh, I can see where we're we're heading. Like the, the direction was clear, the plan was clear, the style wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it was coming together, and the team ethic was really coming together, as was the pressing. And then it's sort of well after Newcastle, we we just kind of we've been on a bit of a downward slope since, and it's kind of gathered and increased in pace. For other ones. I'm going to go and see what you're saying in the comments here. Um, Mania saying, Ollie said a few often leaked. I'm very curious as to know they are. 
Uh, we've never really been. Everyone's had their sort of suspicions, haven't they, about leaks? I think loads of people thought it was Rio Ferdinand back in the day. Um, who do they think there were leaks after that? Dean Henderson, I think people were accusing him of being leaks. That, that, no one's got any idea. It might not necessarily be a player. It might just be a, a player's friend or a player's partner or, I don't know, someone in the kitchen. I've got no idea. Um, when was the last time you saw a player kiss the badge? I swear Anthony kissed the badge after he scored a bloody goal against Arsenal. I swear he did that straight away. I mean, that's kind of lip service, really. Martinez is the one that's actually played for the badge. You don't have to kiss the badge to play for the badge. Um, Nuruddin, you're not sitting on the fence. You're saying Ten Hag in. God, I'd love him to be successful. I, I've, I've said this, I've, I said this yesterday. I've, I'll say this multiple times. I think Eric Ten Hag will go. If Eric Ten Hag leaves Manchester United, he will go somewhere else. And he, as long as he's in the right environment, I think he would shine at Bayern Munich. I think he'd be a very good Bayern Munich coach. Would he be, well, I suppose the measure of success as a Bayern Munich coach is, can you win the Champions League? Which could be quite difficult. I mean, so many managers have failed at doing that at that club. But he's not a bad manager because of, yeah, I don't care what people tell me. I know what I've seen from Eric Ten Hag when, when the club is working with him, when everything is in the right direction. And yeah. I don't know whether he's going to get the opportunity at Manchester United, nor do I know whether right now, whether I think he should get the opportunity. And people keep having a go at me and I keep, I'm, I don't care what you think. I'm not sitting one side of it, Ten Hag in or Ten Hag out right now. I'm properly, I'm a mixed, I'm a mixed opinion right now. I think, I, I, I don't know. And I, I think the thing is, is that, Truth be told, I will just, I will trust what Ineos decide. I think we've all got to, really. Well, actually, no, you don't have to. If you want to argue with it, you, you can if you want. But I think they've made a lot of good decisions so far, and I think they'll make the right decision with the manager. I just don't know what that decision is. Not yet, anyway. Um... I don't think that winning or losing against Everton this weekend changes anything. There is a possibility that winning or losing against Liverpool could change things. I don't think it will be in a reaction to that, but Manchester United going out of the FA Cup and effectively our season being over might be a tipping point, right? Nishant, you're asking whether we want a poll on Eric Ten Hag. We've had them before, dude. We're not having another one now. Um, but yeah, I think the reaction to the reaction to that comment from... Solskjaer on McTominay and, and Rashford, I thought was it was a really strange for so many United fans to interpret it that way. That's the sort of thing that a non-United fan would do. Surely the default point for United fans would be in there to jump in to support a player rather than using something that can be interpreted in another way against them. I don't know. It's strange. Nuruddin, you're saying, reading into Ten Hag's work at Ajax and the structure and how they spoke of him and what he's been through here, he must stay. He's of that metal. What could have been, right? Right now, that's what it's looking like. What could have been? What 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 could have been if Martinez had never gotten injured? I don't think this season would have been in any way, shape or form the season it has been had Martinez been fit the whole season. But the problem is, and this has been a problem, is that the quality past the starting eleven because our recruitment has been poor and Eric Ten Hag is definitely partly responsible for that. As soon as that starting 11 goes out and the injuries come in, the quality hasn't been there throughout the entire team and all of a sudden you have to be pragmatic. All of a sudden you have to change. He was pragmatic last season after we lost against Brentford and... Who was the first game of the season? Wolves? Who was the first game of the season at Old Trafford? Burnley? I can't actually remember anymore. I know we lost away at Brentford. I know we lost away at Brentford. After we lost those two games and that's when he changed the style of football. Started going more... Uh, Brighton, there you go. Of course it was. It was Brighton. And then we went more direct and it worked. We won four in a row. Beat Arsenal, beat Liverpool. But then this season, he's just... He's gone pragmatic to the point where you don't know who he is anymore. The pragmatism has sort of taken over the personality, really. 
that pragmatism is now the philosophy. Akash, thanks for Super Chat, dude. You're saying this, you're saying, so Dave must have waived the NDA for Ole to speak about this. No coincidences is coming out now. Ten Hag in, young and upcoming coaches need time. Um, no, the NDA wouldn't have been waived. The NDA would have had an expiry date. I imagine it was probably just hit that expiry date. And it's not, it's not, is it, I'm going to sell shy yet. Like, you know, where he was speaking about Ronaldo. It's so painfully obvious that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer would love to say, I didn't want to sign Ronaldo, but the club wanted me to. So I bought into it. Even though I didn't really think it was the right thing at the time, how can you turn down the greatest goal scorer of all time, even if he isn't part of your plans? But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer would never say that. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will always sort of step back. He will always be as polite as possible and he will say, yeah, 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 I wanted him. He didn't want him, man. He didn't want him. And he said that if there's one thing I can go back and change, it would be Ronaldo coming in. And that's exactly what I would change as a fan. That's the one change. That's the one thing that I, if that, the two things with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer that had they been different, I think it would have been a different path. The what ifs. If we had won that bloody penalty shootout against Villarreal, I mean, we should have won that, man. Oh, God. I remember I was around my mate Chris's house. Chris on a podcast. Oh. What is it we lost? Like, third, was it... De Gea missed a penalty, didn't he? So it was like 11-10 on penalties. Anyway, if we had won that Euro, Europa final against Villarreal, and if we hadn't assigned Ronaldo, I think if those two things had been different, I think it could have been... It could have been a different story with him. With him. That's what I think anyway. Um, Piero sent a super chat. What are you saying? We signed 300 players. Is this the manager's fault or poor research from the recruitment department? Dude, that's got absolutely nothing to do with the manager. A manager can just want to sign a player, but the research, that the scouting team, that the actual people who are working on recruitment, hey, lads, it's got an injury. The medical department who is doing the medical before you're signing a player. I'm sure they probably especially with Hoyland, they probably accepted it and go, well, he'll be all right. We'll work on that because otherwise it would have had to say no to Hoyland and then had to sign somebody else. Um, Nuruddin, you just gifted five memberships, dude. Thank you so much. I'm not pressing that button this time though because it's going to crash my computer. So big up to you. You're, you're constantly so generous, man. What is this that's coming out here? Wow, look at this. Hopefully this is the beginning of them being folded. I'll move on to the next talking point after this as well. Right. Look at this story. Blue Code 22, the company which Clear Lake Capital and Todd Bowley bought Chelsea and Strasbourg with, has announced a loss of £653 million. <laughs> £653 uh. They also announced that Chelsea made a loss of 90.1 million. Now, you know full well about profit and sustainability rules, ladies and gents. If Chelsea managed to get out, uh, if they managed to cook their books enough to get around these profit and sustainability rules, my, 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 their accountants are gangsters. Because you can only, of course, over a three-year reporting period... Make a loss of 105 million pounds, so long as 90 million of that is provided by by the owners, and that won't be a problem for Chelsea. But I don't know what their profit and loss are for the year before, and I don't know. Well, I just don't know. But that is a serious loss. Oh, I've I've, re I've I've said this so many times in this channel. If there was one club I could fold, it would definitely be Chelsea. Oh, I ho I hope they fold, man. Oh, God, it'll be good. Mm. I don't know why why is it I hate Chelsea I think the reason I hate Chelsea so much is because they were the, the club the third they were the club that initiated it all with Roman Abramovich the oligarch who pillaged Russian state assets got them off for cheap and didn't care about his money because he was trying to clean it and just fired it into Chelsea. Didn't care about profit whatsoever. Like the, as far as a fan is concerned, it's a dream owner. A billionaire comes in who doesn't care about his millions and just wants to keep spending, 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 spending. That's why I hate Chelsea. 
because it just transformed everything. And it was that that after Mourinho and Abramovich came in was when there was all the reports about whether Fergie was going to retire. Remember that? I think it was 2006. And then Fergie came back. Not only did he come back from, I think Mourinho came in in 2003, four. That's when Abramovich came into. Um, not only did he come back, but Man United's arguably best Premier League team existed then between 2006 and 2010. And particularly those two years oh, with the double year. Oh, man. Mm. Steve. Steve. Thank you so much, dude. You get the five memberships as well. I always find it hilarious. So many of you enjoy just listening to me ramble sometimes. Because I do ramble sometimes. A lot of the time I do actually run through actual genuine stories uh, and news. But sometimes I do ramble. But yeah, I hate Chelsea. So the idea that they're going to breach PSR rules makes me a laugh. Now, let's move on to the next one. Yes, Steve, let's all join the Discord. Indeed. Let me drop the link. The link, by the way, can I confirm? The link is definitely working now. You were right early this week. It wasn't working. Apologize about that. But it definitely is working now. Um, David Jackson, you're saying 267 likes on a video. Let's get to 400 then, peeps. Come on. 130 of you. I'm sure there's loads of you watching. In fact, I can see there's 1,600 of you watching on Facebook and YouTube. Drop a like on a video, peeps. Makes a big difference. Now, do you want to know something hilarious about this? Omar Barada has held clandestine meetings. Meetings that are so secret, so under the radar, that Samuel Luckhurst has written an article on it. <laughs> like, do you remember Tricky Happy TV with the bloke who sat there with the newspaper? Do, 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 do. I used to love Tricky Happy TV. Anyway, Samuel Luckhurst is sitting there peeping over a bush going, oh yeah, what are you doing over there, Omar? Come on then. Secret meeting. Got you covered. All right. <laughs> uh, that's just funny I don't know I just found that funny uh, Omar Bar we've, we've seen multiple reports of this now actually over the last couple of weeks that so Omar Barad is on his gardening leave right? and gardening leave is when you leave one company and you aren't allowed to start work for the rival company before sitting out this period of gardening leave you're still on full pay is that the dream by the way if you ever get into a position in work in life or you're in a gardening leave I had a couple of mates who had one I think I may have one for like nine months it's like Full pay, nine months off, it is the dream. But he's just sitting there, he's having his meetings, he's working in the background, no doubt he's he's writing his master plan. I wonder when he'll actually start. Do you think it'll be like as soon as the last, when is the last, I think 19th of May is the last day of the season, isn't it? Do you think that Omar Baradish is going to be like bowling into, bowling into Carrington in, in the 20th of May? With his big old dossier that he's been building while sitting there on his gardening leave. His garb must look great. Anyway, clandestine. So clandestine that uh, Samuel Luckhurst knows about it. Made me laugh that. Um, <laughs> it's the word clandestine for me. <laughs> Sounds like you're playing Rainbow Six. Um, what other talking points have we got here? Oh, yeah. Let me run through this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, can I do this one first? Let's, let's just continue me hating Chelsea so much because this is this is fantastic news. So some sort of some sort of media chief that existed at United, some American dude, Phil Lynch. He's left. He's handing in his notice, and where's he joining? <laughs> ah, he's going Chelsea. Mm -mm. Why on earth would you hire anybody from Manchester United? I mean, our media department is. I get it. I hate having to say this. It really, really do. But Man City is just, it leads the way. Stuff behind the scenes, the content they do on their YouTube channel. Yeah, man. And United is just far behind. <laughs> so Chelsea have now taken our ex-media chief. Go on, Chelsea. Chelsea. I heard that Chelsea, new Chelsea talk. Chelsea, Chelsea, Chelsea. It's incredible. It's my favourite chart in the world. Um, right, let's speak about this. This is nice. Because the, uh, the reason I'm doing this, I've, I'm setting this up for something. I've got a lovely video coming out, hopefully, tomorrow evening on Martinez, and I'll run through that. But uh, Amab was speaking, it was just a little interview, and he was asked, who's the most difficult player you've faced in training? He said, Martinez. He's very strong in training. For him, training is like the Champions League final. He never trains easy. 
He goes stronger, so it's harder to train against him. Oh, man. It is ridiculous how much we've missed him. And it is ridiculous, really, how there is not another personality inside this United squad that comes kind of anywhere near close to the the sort of impact that Martinez had on that team. It's just a case of where we where we were and where we want to get to. Moncton John, you're down at, you're bragging you had two years, two to five years gardening leave. Mate, your guard must look sick. Must have one of those bushes that's like crafted. Like Edward Scissorhands. Um anyway, Martinez. I mean, he might play a couple of games towards the end of the season. I don't really want him to. If I'm being perfectly honest, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a reason that we should be bringing him back in and risking any sort of. I mean, remember that that injury he got was not a repeat injury. He's had his metatarsal, double metatarsal surgery, and then was it Kufal just sat on his sat on his knee. Luckily, he put his he's put his weight on his on his arms. Lots of you talking about Martinez getting captaincy, maybe, when he comes back. But then to take that away from Bruno, I don't think Eric Ten Hag would do that, personally. But there's a nice little video that's coming out here. I think you'll enjoy this one. I'm bringing out the shotgun again, and we're going, we're going full tilt at Jamie Carragher. I've done this before, but I'm just I'm going to add a lot more sort of production value and quality to it. It's going to be, you can call it if you want, like a mini documentary. Only be like eight, nine minute video. But it's going to be focusing on Jamie Carragher's comments that Lissandro Martinez is too short to play in the Premier League, which has been spectacularly proven wrong. And also a little bit of a nod towards um, the relationship and the bond that Martinez has built with Manchester United fans. Hopefully that'll be going out tomorrow. I think you'll enjoy that. You've, you've, re you've already enjoyed the uh, video we did on Hoyland. Uh, we're now going to be doing one on, well, we've done one on Pogba too. Going to be trying to do one of these a week. I love these sorts of videos. I really, really do. The, the, the shorter mini documentaries, the longer deep dives. These are the sorts of videos that no other channel will do. And I want to do more of them. Because I think it's a, it's a type of content that so many of you enjoy. And I'll be honest, they're probably some of my favorite videos to do as well. Mikafa, what you're saying, I would give Eric Ten Hag one more year for what if. Nah, man. I wouldn't give Eric Ten Hag a one more year for what if. We've finally got owners with ambition. We're finally going to have a CEO and a sporting director and a probably head of recruitment or a technical director or a performance director. We're going to have the whole structure in place. It's not about having a manager for what if. It is about if Ineos decide... I suppose, basically, the, the question that Ineos are asking themselves, when they all sit down at the round table, they go, right, we've seen what Eric Ten Hag can do as United manager, okay? Won a trophy in his first year, ended the drought, played brilliant football at times. He succeeded in his first season. It's fair to say that his second season has absolutely not gone to plan. It's fair to say the recruitment has been poor. It's fair to say that he's made a lot of incorrect decisions. The question is whether or not Ineos have enough belief that football that existed between January 2023 and February 2023 is enough to give Eric Ten Hag the chance of bringing that back in a new structure or whether they think there's too much damage done and to reputation, to morale, to authority this season that means that that's not going to be possible even in the right environment. And that's the question that Ineos are going to be asking themselves. Injuries, of course, playing a massive part of it too. But that's going to be the question that Ineos asks themselves. And their, their, their answer to that will be the decision that drives whether or not Eric Ten Hag gets another season or whether they feel that going down a different path is their option. That's going to be the driving decision. All opinions aside, that's going to be the thing that drives it. DP saying, why is recruitment poor? Dude, recruitment is poor. I, I've said at the time, some people don't like it and they think I'm of some sort of Casemiro agenda. Casemiro was a catastrophic signing for the long-term plan of our football club. In the short term, 
He gave us a brilliant season. But he was never a long-term replacement. Uh, well, he's never long-term anyway. He was 30 when we signed him. So therefore, that's a shit. We don't know what we're doing. Let's just get Casemiro in and let's kick the can down the road. We haven't got time to find a perfect Dion replacement. Let's just get Ca Casemiro in. It's exactly what that signing was. Kicking the can down the road because we're now picking it up again. Right? I'm going to really, really copy your comments out down here. Uh, Stephen Neary, you're not happy. I wouldn't give Eric Ten Hag the lawnmower to cut the grass. He needs to go. Now is the time for a full reset. He has to go. He's out of his depth and looks totally lost. We are too big for him. Didn't particularly look too big for him. I mean, a lot of times we haven't looked too big for him. The amount of stuff that he's dealt with, with the Ronaldo situation, with Sancho, with the club, with winning our first trophy in six, seven years, with dealing with the discipline. I think he's shown a lot. But then this year, he's massively struggled and completely gone away from any sort of principles that he had to the point where you don't know what they were anymore. He's definitely gone too far down that. The pragmatism has taken over, which is always a risk with pragmatism because if it you go down that path and it works, it's kind of hard to reverse and go back to where you were before. And again, that's kind of partly why I think at this point, it's a bit of a foolish, I wouldn't say lazy, but it's just kind of a foolish argument to say, oh, look, well, Arteta got, it worked It worked with Arteta. He just kind of stuck to his principles. It didn't work, but eventually they kind of came through it. And eventually the recruitment came right. And eventually Edu started working with Arteta and the structure was there behind him. Doesn't mean it's going to work for Ten Hag. It goes all saying, Sam, you really sound like you want Eric Ten Hag to go. I do not want him to go. Why do people say this shit? I cannot say with any confidence that he is going to be our manager next season because I'm looking at the facts in front of me. I would love nothing more than for Eric Ten Hag to find that form, but I, I don't know whether enough whether there's so much damage done now to his reputation, to how Ineos view him. I don't know whether it's gone past the point of no return. I can't make that call yet. Joshua is saying, imagine if he had a good structure behind him. Imagine, imagine he had the good structure behind him when he came in the bloody door, man. That's what annoys me. Regardless of what happens from this point on with Eric Ten Hag, we have fumbled. We have fumbled it massively. Remember that before Eric Ten Hag came in, you remember the videos I've done. Boy, was I excited because I could finally see you know, I, I, we went from Ragnick to Eric Ten Hag, and I was like, "Geez, that's an actual that is a that is a succession plan." I, like, I know what I know. I know what this club is trying to do. For the first time in a long time, I could see where I think we wanted to get to in a few years' time. And then, well, we know what's happened since. But when he came in, he was one of the faces with the new faces. I think Nagelsmann at that time was that when he joined Bar was that when he joined Bayern Munich. He, uh, we are talking like there were like three or four managers at that time. Where everyone's like, well, this is the new wave of managers. These are going to be the managers that set the trends in the same way that Guardiola did and, and Mourinho did when they came in and they came through. And he was part of that new, I want to call it like new age or new revolution, but it was just he was that age and he was, yeah, he was breaking out. I swear Nagelsmann was one of them. And I think Ten Hag was another one. I don't know, I don't know who else was at that time. And now people are going, oh, it could be Ruman Amarim or, or De Zerbi. These are the new ones. Well, that's what Ten Hag was before he bloody came to United. Man, if we, the, reason he, the reason he thrived at Ajax was because they had the structure in place. The reason it sort of crumbled was because it started to crumble. Over Mars, all the problems that he had and getting booted out of the club. Lost that, that, that little triumvirate, triumvirate they had. Of Van der Sar, Overmars, and Ten Hag just worked. And at Manchester United, Eric Ten Hag never had that. And he had to be authoritative. Authoritative. He had to be almost like dictator. He almost had to be like a dictator. I'm in charge. I'm running recruitment. I'm in charge of dis discipline and decisions and all of this. And that structure doesn't work in, in elite modern football clubs. You can't have that. There's, there is too much. Fergie wouldn't. Fergie's style of management, I've said this a few times as well. Fergie's style of management would not have been successful in the modern game. Manchester United never had a Twitter account until Fergie left. Fergie would not be able to... 
Fergie's man management style would have clashed so much with the modern player uh, that it would have just been it would have just been a who's who of Yapstam, David Beckham style fallouts with Fergie. It would have just been spectacular. Would have been fireworks, wouldn't have been good for United. That sort of model doesn't work anymore. Not in the modern game. There's too much power that exists in players. That's why you need your, your support structure. A support structure Eric Ten Hag has never had. Solskjaer never had. A support structure which is coming in now, but I wonder whether it's... I don't know. Very frustrated. I'll be honest. Very frustrated with just everything that's going on with United still. How many points do you reckon we're taking from these? We'll wrap up the show with this one. There's a super chat there. I'm going to read a couple of your comments. I'll read a couple from Facebook as well. And Nuruddin is saying, I'm calm. Gut tells me he's getting a new contract. Could be wrong, but I feel very strongly about it. I suppose if... Well, when you, when you, when you think about it, if Ineos do decide to go with Eric Ten Hag, then I think he would get a new contract because he only got one year left. So if they were to decide to go with Eric Ten Hag, I, I don't think it would be a one-season thing. I don't know. Just let me know in the comments there. You've got a max of 15 from Everton at home, Liverpool at home, Brentford away, Chelsea away, and Liverpool at home. Oh, no, that's Liverpool in the FA Cup. So that's maximum of 12 points and the FA Cup. Man, we've got some pretty hard games coming up, if I'm honest. Let me see what you're saying on Facebook here, right? Let's pop some comments here. In today's woke society, Fergie will be sacked because the players cry. I hate that word, woke, man. Do you ever remember seeing that? Um, it always makes me laugh. I think it was, it was on like Good Morning TV or something like that. And there was a, there was an author who wrote a book, and one of the chapters was on woke. <laughs> and then the person who was interviewing her was like, "What's the definition of woke?" And then she just, she froze. She was like, uh, 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 "She's like, oh, this is gonna be one of those things that gets clipped up, isn't it?" <laughs> And it did. Because <laughs> so many people love using that. Oh, this is woke this, woke that. And they can't really actually tell you what it means. I don't honestly really know what it means. I, I hate any that, in conversations like that. That is just pointless. I'd rather bang my head against a brick wall. Right, let me see what you're saying points-wise. Um, easy wins, all of them. Five points, says Madhouse. Five points, says Kagotso. Jordan, you're saying nine. Expected nine, probably six. I'm hoping we're going to beat Everton at home. Brentford away, bad memories. That what haven't Brentford season been? Um, Brentford season is uh, I swear they've been massively up and down. I swear they've lost like a fair amount. Chelsea away. Well, you know we'll get chances against Chelsea. That's for sure. And then Liverpool at home. That's going to be tidy, tidy, tasty. Seven says Wendy. Nine and out of the cup says Andrew. Uh, Katie, you remember that interview I was talking about? It's funny, man. I might go watch this after this. Maybe three points against Everton, says Sandman. One each against Brentford or Chelsea and not expecting anything against Liverpool. <sighs> Two home games against Liverpool. In March, in Jurgen Klopp's farewell season, where they are trying to go for it all and they've already won the League Cup. That should be like an adrenaline shot to the arse of, air, of any United player of merit, of any United player of worth. You could really... United could single-handedly screw it all up for them. We could knock them out of the FA Cup and we could spank them at Old Trafford and, and just see their title hopes fade away. We could do that. If we're any good. Hypothetically. And if the players wanted it enough. Uh, that, that game against the FA Cup's gonna be a that's gonna be a, a, a mad atmosphere. FA Cup, by the way. So remember, I think Liverpool are gonna get I'm guessing like six, seven thousand. I think so. I I look, King, we oui, I know I'm dreaming, King. I'm just telling you. That's what's that is what is on the plate for these players. The possibility of just popping that balloon. If both of those games were at Anfield, I'd feel sick already. 
we would crumble in that. Anyway, we got some tidy games. Why did I say tidy games twice? Idiot. Last point of the show here, which I said at the start, and I'll say it again. Peeps, you're all streetwise, all right? We've all covered and spoken about United News often enough now on this channel as a community that we can interpret this news in the right way. It's just hot air. All right? I'm going to be doing one video on this at lunchtime today when I speak about all 10, 11 managers. I don't even, I don't even know how many managers we've been linked with, but I'm going to run through all of them in one video and say, calm down, please. All right, I'm going to wrap that up for today. Um, thank you all for tuning in. I apologize that the buttons didn't work. Big up to everybody who gifted memberships earlier, from Mania to Gungshi to Nuruddin to Steve, uh, lots more as well. You're all legends, all of you. I'll be here tomorrow. It's Friday. De -de -de -de. Um, we'll get the Discord working again tomorrow. Last week it didn't really work properly because nobody else no, <laughs> nobody joined in. But I will say it one more time down here. Here is the link to Discord. There are so many of you who are members now, but all you've got to do is go to Discord, connect your YouTube account to Discord, and you'll come into the members only chat. And inside there, that's where you can join live tomorrow for a call in. All right. And you can come and have a chat with me. All right. Big up to all of you. I'll be there with a lunchtime video today. I'll see you soon. Uh oh.